this weekend um, in Victory is always my favorite weekend uh, of, uh, throughout the whole year. It is our opportunity to give in our Christmas gift to the world offering. Uh, this is a big deal to us. We've been doing this for a long time, since the very beginning uh, of the church. We said every year we wanna give our best gift to Jesus. So practically speaking for us, what that means is whatever is the best gift that I give all year is X, Jesus gives, gets X plus one. I mean, that's just what it means to us is that we're gonna give our best gift to Jesus because I'm just like the next guy. I, I believe in you know uh, socks and bikes and iPads and whatever you're gonna to give uh, this year, but how many of you know there are actually things that we can give that matter, right? That are gonna, there are weightier, more eternal things that we can give to, and so we're gonna have the opportunity to do that today. If you're new with us, uh, half of our giving is going locally here to an organization called Street Grace, and uh, the other half is going uh, globally to an organization called Life uh, Change International, and both of those organizations, uh, that one's in Thailand, um, both of the organizations are literally on the ground in the trenches in a very practical way combating uh, the sexual exploitation of minors, uh, sex trafficking. And so that's a big deal. Like this is something we're proud that we can actually get behind uh, and, and support something that God really cares a lot about. So uh, I was thinking about this this last night. I can't believe we're already here. I don't know if you stopped to think about this recently. Like it's already December, 2018. Like we're already on this weekend, you know, our Christmas gift to the world offering. You're going to blink. It's going to be 2019. You're going to blink again. It's going to be 2020. You're going to blink again. Jesus is going to come back. Like I don't, everything's moving so fast right now. Um, and this year uh, began, maybe you're new with us and you've seen our 10 book, like this red 10 book out at the cafe. You're wondering what that, what is that all about? We started this year with this idea of 10. Uh, we boiled it all down to say, hey, there are actually 10 qualities of what a disciple of Jesus looks like. Uh, because again, if you're wondering what's the DNA of the house, the DNA of the house is this, is we don't wanna just get together and sing Jesus songs in here. We wanna live Jesus lives out there. And that's really the, the heart of the house. You find that in that 10 book. So that's how we started the year. How we're finishing the year is kind of in the same vein. We're asking this question like, uh, what are, what are the, the, the top characteristics of Jesus that the Father wants to get inside our hearts? Like, what, what are the ways that, that we could be more like him that would change us and change the world around us? Because if there's anybody that we want to be like, it's Jesus. And so last week, we talked about the, the humility of Jesus. And today, what we're talking about is that against all odds, Jesus actually valued people. Jesus actually valued people. I don't know if you have stopped to think about this recently, but it is completely ridiculous that Jesus valued people. Like, I, listen, I know you probably read your Bible, lots of us, right? So you're cheating, right? You know how it all plays out, but think about this. You're God, you come down here, you're messing with us. Who gives a flip about us? Right? Like, like David even says that. Let me give you two quick scriptures. King David in the, in the Old Testament, he cries out Psalm 8, 4. He says, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Right? Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we're formed. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows it over and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. That's your pick me up this morning. Right, like I've known a number of atheists in my life. I actually, one of my former coworkers at a place I worked at before uh, coming on staff here at Victory, uh, she was married to an atheist and his favorite saying was like, hey, I'm just worm food. Like I'm gonna live, I'm gonna die, they're gonna put me in a box and worms are gonna eat my body and I'm just gone. And so for a second, can we just say the atheist got it a little right? Like, it just again, just pull back just, to, just for a second. We're here for a, like a breath of vapor. At most, you get 100 years, right? Like, it, we are like flowers of the field that are here one day. The wind blows. They're gone. Where did it go? I don't know. I thought it was just here. Like, that's how long our lives are. Yet somehow, despite all that, God actually cares about us. Right? Like, despite all that, the omnipotent, omnipresent, pre existent, omniscient, all knowing, all powerful, mighty God puts on skin and he comes down, and instead of hanging out in palaces, he hangs out in gutters. Right? He doesn't, he doesn't look for, for us to give him value, he turns around and he gives us value. He doesn't, like, he doesn't demand, like, hey, give value to me, he gives value to them. 
Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, I know we cheat because we read the Bible, but think about that. Like, God cares about people. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't make any sense. Jesus, Jesus is found touching lepers, right? Like, I, I'm not, don't do it right now, but go home later today and Google Hansen's disease. That's the modern term for leprosy. Um, it's terrible, right? Today, we know how to treat it, but it's a bacterial um, infection. What it does, it gets inside your nervous system. That's where it starts uh, to the point where slowly, but eventually you can't feel anything. Like literally your entire, everything goes numb. So where we uh, feel a rock in our shoe and we get it out, they don't feel a rock in their shoe and it wears a hole in their foot. And so infection gets in. Lots of times blood flow gets restricted. And so extremities will start falling off. Teeth will fall out. Many times they'll go blind. I saw a picture of a guy with leprosy. He had no eyes and he had no hands. And so they didn't know how this disease spread, and so they exiled the people. And so uh, you didn't get to kiss your wife goodbye, your kids goodbye, your husband goodbye. You lost your family, you lost your home, you lost your business. Now you go live outside the city, and everywhere you go, you have to ring a bell, and you have to say, unclean, unclean, so that nobody will accidentally touch you. And the problem is with most diseases is the pain. The problem with leprosy is the numbness. You just can't feel anything, and nobody for the rest of your life will ever touch you again. Yet Jesus comes along. And he says, I know who you are. I know what you've got. I know what everybody says about you. I know how unclean you are. I know everybody's saying I shouldn't be anywhere around you, but I want to touch you. And Jesus touches lepers. And Jesus hangs out with tax collectors. Come on, somebody. Any of y'all want to hang out with a tax collector? Jesus goes to the well at the hottest time of the day when nobody goes to the well because that's when the rejects go to the well. The outcasts go to the well, and he finds the Samaritan woman there on purpose. Jesus is constantly finding the most worthless people and giving them worth. And then like Romans 3, when we were at our worst, when we were completely worthless, Jesus spread out his arms, and he died for us. Right? Here's, I love this. Uh, Romans 5 says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some, someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Think about that. That person who cut you off in traffic, Jesus died for them too. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe. When we were at our worst, when we had no worth, Jesus gave us worth. Jesus sees the, the, the addict in the back alley and he sees value. Jesus sees the woman who's just been beaten by her husband and he sees value. Jesus sees the teenager who feels like nobody cares. He's picking up the razor blade. He sees value. Jesus sees the guy who just lost his job again, feels like a failure. He sees value. Jesus sees the stay-at-home mom who feels like nobody else sees her. He sees value. Jesus sees value. And, and, I, and I think, guys, what we have to do is we have to reclaim what I believe that God wants to do today is give us the gift of being able to reclaim this core value of life that we actually value people, right? That we actually see people as important. I know, here's the problem. Here's the problem. When was the last time we actually thought about anybody but ourselves? If we don't have kids, besides our kids, because they demand it. Right? Like, when was the last time you saw the guy driving down on the interstate as a person rather than as an inconvenience? When was the last time, come on, somebody, you were in Publix and the, the person and the 10 items or less line had 11 items? And you're like, Jesus, come back now. <laughs> Call security. I'm going to shoot somebody. Like, because we live in a world that sees people more as inconveniences than as people. Right? Like, we live in a world that, that, that politics uses people for votes, and, and businesses use people for profit, and porn uses people for pleasure, and video games kill people for points, and Planned Parenthood kills babies for convenience, and we just don't care about people anymore. We don't value anybody anymore is if they don't give us value. We only value people who give us value. When was the last time we valued somebody with no strings attached and they could never give you value back, right? Like that, that person that, that needs the grace, standing in the 11, you know, the, the 10 items or less line with 11, like they need Jesus too, maybe more than you do right now because they have 11 items or less in the 10 <laughs> items line. But we'll never be able to actually give that to them unless we slow down and actually see them as people. 
And I, and I believe that God wants to give us the gift of caring again. Can we agree on that? Like, what would it look like if we actually cared again? And that's a really tricky thing because we live in a world that doesn't. So here's what I want to do, okay? I want to do something. It's a little unconventional because I know lots of times we come into church and we're just used to like sitting and just listening for, for a long time. Um, I want to do something that's going to require a little bit of crowd participation. You okay with that? Even if you're not, you're going to do it. Um, <laughs> especially on a day like today, I think this is a good idea, okay? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something that's probably going to be the most uncomfortable moment of your life. You ready for this? I mean, I'm, this is terrible. What we're about to do, you're going to hate me for just a few minutes, all right? But I'm going somewhere with this, okay? Here's what I want you to do, okay? Across this whole room, and there's a lot of people in here, um, I want you to pair up. Now stop, okay? Try, you probably shouldn't have to get up out of your seat to do this, okay? If, you, if, if there's enough people in here, uh, try not to let it be somebody who, like, you're married to or is a kid. Don't cheat. Um, so turn to somebody you don't know. If that's not possible, you can cheat. You can just do it with somebody you know. But um, I, here's what I want you to do. Just spend 10 seconds and turn around and be like, all right, me and you, okay? 10 seconds and pair up, all right? Y'all are a talkative bunch. Here's the thing, some of y'all already, mission accomplished, you already met somebody you didn't know. That's pretty awesome. All right, okay, bring it back in, bring it back in. Everybody paired up? All right, okay, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go. All right, okay, that was awesome, that was great. Hey, met somebody new. Okay, here's where it gets awkward. It's about to get awkward, okay? All right, for one minute, 60 seconds, one minute, I want you to look into that person's eyes <laughs> without breaking gaze, and you can't say a word for one minute, okay? All right, you're already talking. You already, you already lost, okay? Here we go. Everybody be quiet. Bring it down. 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 Here we go. No talking, and you can't break gaze, okay? Here it is. 60 seconds and go. Stop cheating. I know, I've done this before. I know what it's like. Keep it going. You're getting there. You're halfway. stop. All right. In all honesty, that was 90 seconds. All right. Just, just going to be honest about that. All right. You're like, I knew it. I knew it. All right. All right. Let's hear some feedback. Let me get it from like right here. What was that like? Terrible. Awkward. We get one thumbs up. Did you know the person? You're like, okay, all right. Over here, what? Awkward. Funny. Were you looking at the person? Were they funny looking? What? Awesome. Okay. Okay. Um, 
I've gone through this too, and so it's, it's gonna make sense here in a minute, because I acknowledge, that was terrible. All right, for me, I don't know what you're like. I hear some people are like, it was amazing, and I look, <laughs> looking into their soul. You're just more spiritual than I am. Um, it was terrible, it was, it was awful when I did this. Um, now here's, here's what I'm gonna do, all right? We're gonna do it again. Oh, da, da, da. All right, one change, one difference, okay? When you're looking into this person's eyes without talking, here's how I want you to enter into this moment. Right now, even in your own heart, I want you to start praying. Say, God, show me how you feel about this person. God, give me your heart for this person. Maybe even be praying for him. Say, God, even after service, is there something that you want to tell this person through me, a way that you wanna bless them? So God, how do you feel about this person right here? Okay, so the same person you were just with. All right, one minute. Without breaking eye contact, can't say a word. But this time, the one difference is, God, let me know, tell me how you feel about this person and go. Come on, even if it's two guys. stop. All right, you can kind of go back to your spots if any of y'all moved. Um, all right, let me ask this group again. What was that like? Anything different? Better? Beautiful? More thumbs up? I got shorter? Yeah, that was definitely shorter. It was about 30 seconds shorter. Yeah? Again, I, so I, I, I've done that before, um, several times. And I realized like, if you're married, like most married people don't look in each other's eyes for more than like five seconds. Because the first time, all you're thinking about is like, did I have something on my face? <laughs> like, did, did I brush my teeth this morning? I knew I should have put a Tic Tac in. Like, do I have a straight eyebrow? Like what's, all you're, you're thinking about like, oh my gosh, like all, this is so awkward. And I was like, this is so awkward. The second time, I'm actually, for 60 seconds, I'm stop, I've stopped thinking about myself. And I'm actually wanting to feel God's heart for you. Like that you actually matter too. There's actually, you understand there's actually more people in this story than just me. And I know that's hard because I'm in every scene of my story, right? Like in every, the movie of my life, I'm in every clip of it. <laughs> And so I think it, sometimes it's hard to understand, man, there's a lot of stories that God is telling, even in this room right here. And some of us, you sit next to people all day long, I mean, every single Sunday, and we just don't even know anybody. And maybe even so, today, some of you got a word for somebody, tell them after service, to say, hey, God feels this way about you, and he just wanted you to know. And I, because I think there's power when for one stinking minute, we stop thinking about me, and I start getting God's heart for you that you matter to. <laughs> Philippians 2, 3, all right, here it is. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others. Value others, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. What would it look like if for one minute we got our eyes off of ourself and we started getting God's heart for other people. Okay, so here's what I want to do. Um, we're going to give in just a few minutes, and we're going somewhere um, with, this, with this idea of value. But here's what I want to do. I was just kind of thinking about this, and I want to give us a handful of ways that we can actually start bringing value into the different settings of our lives. Okay, what does it look like to, to value in certain places to certain people? Here's the first part, is that value starts in the home. Value people in my home first. 
Um, we have to value in before we can value out. We need to value in the home first. Uh, a few years ago, um, I was in a, uh, in a pastor's uh, meeting. I was leading a pastor's conference in India. And uh, I, 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 I didn't know what a cultural taboo it was when I said the statement, uh, but the whole meeting derailed and I had to spend time on this. I actually said this. I said, pastors, I mean, you know that your family is more important than your ministry, right? And they all looked at me like I had a hand growing out of my face. They're like, what is this that you speak of? Because here's, you know, if, if you've never been in any sort of ministry, what, what happens is that very quickly the lines get blurred that uh, I confuse loving Jesus with what I do for Jesus. Um, and so especially in, in pastors' homes, this is why a lot of pastors have, have really bad marriages and why many pastors' kids uh, hate God and don't want anything to do with the church because pastors always blame God for why they're never home. And that's not a cool blaming, uh, uh, blame shift there. Um, and so in, in this room, when I'm saying like, hey, you know, like your wife is more important than ministry, your kids are more important than ministry, like, I don't know, depending on your age, um, you understand like, like the value starts with valuing your parents or valuing starts with valuing your brothers or your sisters in your own house. The value starts at home. When, when, when I'm telling them this, there was an absolute complete disconnect because here's what I learned early on in ministry is that there's always going to be somebody pulling on you. All right, this goes for you. You may be in business or whatever you're doing. There's always gonna be somebody pulling on you. Guys, let me tell you, there's always an email, there's always a text, there's always a phone call, there's always a Facebook message, there's always this and always that and always that and always that. And I realized this early on, that if I did everything that everybody was asking me to do, um, my family would fall apart. And there's, there's kind of a phrase that we've adopted in ministry. <laughs> it's funny that uh, nobody expects you to do everything, but everybody expects you to do their thing right? No, no, pastor, I understand you can't do everything, but I need you to do this thing just for me, just for me, like all the time. And I realized that if I live life like that, my kids wouldn't have a dad. My wife wouldn't, wouldn't have a husband. And so I, one of, the, fra one of the, the, the sayings that really helped me out early on, and I pray that it maybe sinks down today is by a local pastor here, Andy Stanley. He said this, don't give up what's unique to you for something someone else can do. Don't give up what's unique to you for something someone else can do. I had to understand this. I had to come to this realization. Somebody else someday is going to pastor this church. But nobody else can be a husband to my wife. Nobody else can be a dad to my two sons. I'm the only one who can do that. Listen, somebody else is going to sit in your office someday. Somebody else is going to take your job. They're going to have your business card. They're going to sit in your chair. Okay, but you're the only one who can be a husband or a wife. You know, you're the only one who can be a parent to your kids. That is your only unique role. I am completely replaceable in this role. You're completely replaceable in your role out there in the world. I know you don't like to think about it. Someday you'll retire. Someday you'll get pushed out, whatever that is. But the only place you are not interchangeable is at home. Your kids need you. Your wife needs you. Your husband needs you. Why would I give up what's unique to me for something that somebody else can do? Okay. I'm just telling you guys this, when it comes to my family suffering or some people in this church suffering, I choose my family. I know some people don't like that, but the only way I'm going to be able to last in ministry is if this thing's healthy over here. I got to be able to take care of my own first, my own home first. And so I value out, but first I have to value in because the easiest people to ignore are the people right underneath your nose because they're the ones many times who don't say anything about it. And then you look back two years and five years and 10 years later and it all falls apart. I don't want to exchange what's unique to me for something that somebody else can do. Listen, you're on call. Okay. I can't do it. They're going to find somebody else to call. Okay. But my wife needs me. My kids need me. I got to be here. I have to prioritize this thing first. Value starts in the home first. So what does that look like? I actually took um, both of my sons last night because I was curious. And uh, Isaac, who's nine, and Jeremiah, who's 13, and I asked them, I said, hey, what, what's, what are, what's something that I do that makes you feel important, that makes you actually feel like you value, like you're, you matter inside our home, like you're valuable? And both of them, independently of each other in different rooms, they said, you spend time with me. You spend time with me. Um, I'm telling you guys, value is spelled T-I-M-E. Value is spelled T-I-M-E. I ask Isaac, what do I do that makes you feel valuable? He says, you spend time with me and you wrestle with me. He's nine. Now, if he was 40, that would be different. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, Jeremiah, who's 13, uh, I said, what do I do that makes you feel valuable? He said, you spend time with me and you teach me how to read the Bible. He said, you don't just read me the Bible, you actually teach me how to read the Bible. Like, not just read the lines, but actually understand and think about and ask questions about what, what the Bible is saying. I, I want to bring value into the home by spending time um, with my kids. I, I want to um, bring value into the home by establishing a financial lifestyle that actually allows me to be at home. I think a lot of us, we buy up here, so we have to work up here. Right, I was just talking to Jeremiah this week. Um, uh, he used to have like a best friend in the neighborhood, and I said, "Hey, we're so and so. Why, why haven't you been hanging out with him?" And he says, "Oh, he's, he's all he does is play video games." And I said, "Really? Yeah." He said, "Yeah, I actually just asked him if he wanted to play football." And he said, "No, man, I got to level up on Call of Duty." That's an exact conversation that happened this week. And I said, "Well, don't his parents like do anything like set any sort of boundaries?" He said, "Dad, his parents are never home." I said, like, never home? He said, no, they're never home. What do you mean? He said, well, they have their own business. And so because they got to afford the, the car, right? You know, they drive the Mercedes. I think there's two Mercedes and the big house. And there's nothing wrong with that sort of stuff. But when, when literally they're gone when he wakes up and they get home at 10 p.m. at night. And so they never see the family that they're providing for. So what sort of a value statement is that, that I've bought up here, so I have to work up here, so I never see the ones in my family? And, and uh, you know, can we, can we agree for a second in the suburbs that to value our kids enough to pull them off of like the stinking Xbox for five minutes or their device, their iPhone, their iPad, whatever it is, can we get off Fortnite for a day? Is that possible? Somebody, anybody? No, I don't know. They, they would freak out if we did that because they're addicted to it, like literally addicted to it. Uh, uh, our, our sons, we don't even let them, we don't let them play video games during the week. Maybe that's a thought for you. Why? Because I actually care about their minds and I care about their future. Uh, uh, before he was transferred, we actually used to have, um, it was the vice president of Costco's dried groceries, dry groceries, that section uh, here in, in the church. He was actually directly over $4 billion in sales. Big dude, he knows what he's talking about. Um, and he said, one of my primary roles is to travel the country selecting the cream of the crop. Like, I go to colleges and I try and find the best of the best of the best to come and work for Costco. And I said, well, how that, how's that going? He said, actually, it's really depressing. And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, these kids are brilliant, but they can't look me in the eye. He said, they don't know how to carry on a conversation because everything they do is this. Everything they do is behind a screen. They don't know how to actually care about people and talk to people and, and lead a, a customer from here to here. They don't know how to have those conversations. They have no common sense. They were never parented. All they did was learn from screens their entire life. And so I actually, one of the ways that I want to bring value into my family, I value kids by not just thinking about now because I'm tired, so just look at the screen. I want to think about their future. Right? I want to think about their future enough that I'm going, to have, I'm going to value them enough to have the tough talks. Come on, somebody, to have the sex talk with your kid. If you don't have the sex talk, Google will have the sex talk with your kid. I promise you, their friends, they'll learn about sex from their friends. Is that really, think about your kid's friends for just for a second. Is that where you want? And if your kid's like past 10 or 11, they've probably already heard the sex talk from somebody. I want to value them enough to have, to, have the, to, to have the dating talk, to set boundaries, to actually have discipline inside my home. I want, I, come on, age-appropriate discipline to our kids. I want to value my family enough to put my device down. Come on, you ever, you ever see families having family time out at the restaurant? And dads? And moms? And son? And daughter? The most, I, I, was, I was actually in a restaurant a few weeks ago. It was the saddest thing. Oh, it made me check because I know I've done this at some point. It's the saddest thing. I was looking at a dad and, uh, and a son. And the son was probably eight. And they're sitting on opposite side of the booth. And they're both sitting there in a fast food restaurant. And the entire time, dad was on his phone. And the kid's just sitting there. For 60 sinking seconds, can I just stop thinking about me? Can I try and get God's heart for you? When was the last time as parents we ever actually said, God, how do you feel about my kids? To your husband, your wife, come on somebody, your brother, your sister. I know how you feel about them, but how does God feel about them? Towards your parents. God, they're driving me crazy right now. 
How does God feel about your parents? What would happen if we actually started bringing value back into the home? Uh, it, maybe some of us, we don't even know how to talk to our kids. Um, we discovered this thing, maybe hit up Amazon later. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Table Topics. And uh, it's this little plexiglass box. It's like this big. Make sure you find, find the family edition because there are other editions. Um, and um, it's to the point where whenever we have uh, dinner, uh, which is no devices allowed in the pockets or in another room, TV's off, um, Isaac uh, <laughs> will go and get it, get this box, and he'll put it down in front of me. He's, uh, we actually have another one now. It's called Can You Imagine? And what it is, these cards, literally, they're just conversation starters. Pull them out, and it's like, hey, if you could be any superhero, what would you be? If you could have any superpower, what would it be? If you could fly to any planet, which one would you go to? Is it better to stay up late or to get up early? It's these conversation starters. If you don't know how to talk to your kids, bring something like that into your time. We're not just all doing this thing. Because, guys, we're, we're, we've, we're losing the ability to care about each other and to relate to each other. One of the reasons, you know, we wonder, like, we kind of sit back and we wonder about the whole bullying thing. Why is bullying such a big thing? Is because if kids are never valued inside the home, they'll never value outside the home. And so what's, what's happening is these kids aren't, don't feel valuable at home, and so they're going out there and trying to get value by terrorizing other kids. That makes them feel like something, at least, because dad never said anything about me. Mom never pays me any attention, right? And so I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get it somewhere else. And what happens, if I can say this just as a pastor here, is even inside, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the people next to you, um, <laughs> is that some of us, we bring our kids out of a, a home that has no honor and has no value, and we bring them to church and expect the church to fix them, right? We expect Vic kids to fix them on a Sunday morning or our middle school ministry to fix them or our high school ministry on a Wednesday night to fix them. I did the math. You get them for 166 hours a week. We get them for two. And we can love them and we can teach them, but I can't be a father. I can't be a mother, right? Right? You're the only one who can do that. And so don't exchange what's unique to you for something somebody else can do, all right? And what would it look like if we, just for, for 60 seconds every single day, if I said, God, help me to get my eyes off me, how do you feel about my wife? How do you feel about my husband? How do you feel about my kids? How do you feel about my brother, sister? How do you feel about my parents? And we actually started caring out, not just caring in, valuing others for just a moment above ourselves, all right? So valuing people. Valuing people begins in the home. Let me give you a handful more. Value people no matter what they believe. Value people no matter what they believe. Just recently, a worship leader named Lauren Daigle went on the uh, Ellen show. I don't know if you saw that. And she got destroyed by the Christian blogger community and every, all the keyboard warriors. Um, uh, just a few months ago, uh, a bunch of uh, black pastors, uh, some with good motives, some with probably not the best motives, uh, sat down with President Trump to talk about prison reform. And they got destroyed online. And, and I don't know where you're at with that, but let me, just, let me just tell you my observation. It's very hard to change things from the outside, right? Let me, let me encourage you. If you get a chance to sit at the table, sit at the table, right? This is why Jesus, right? When, it, when, when Matthew, he recruits tax collector Matthew to be his disciple, Matthew throws a big party, right? Invites all the tax collectors over, invites all the prostitutes over that he knows, invites all these people over. That Jesus isn't outside, he's inside, right? Because nobody ever got hated into changing. Come on. The protesters outside of Ellen, oh, I can't believe you're a lesbian. You're proud of it. That's really going to change her. I'm sure, you know, the president's going to change when everybody tweets at him. Nobody ever got hated into changing. That's why when all the religious leaders are outside, Jesus isn't outside tweeting about how bad the people inside the party are. Jesus goes into the party. <gasps> Jesus is with sinners? Jesus hangs out with unbelievers? He didn't shun the unbeliever? No, in fact, here's what Jesus says, Matthew 5, 14. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. And so they put it on a stand and it gives light to everybody in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If you're never around people who don't believe like you, how are they gonna see your light? If all they do is criticize the, uh, hey, man, we're going to lunch. You want to come? No, you guys cuss when you're at lunch. I can't, I can't be around that. And someone might have a beer. I can't. How, 
how are people ever going to see light if, like, the lamp is outside? Why was there a lamp outside? It does no good to the people in the house. What would happen if the light went into the darkness? Jesus showed people outside the kingdom value by showing up, by going into these really dark places, but on a mission. He wasn't just there hanging out. No, he was there loving people. He was there letting his life shine. He was in the middle of unbelievers. He valued people even when they didn't believe like him. And guys, I'm telling you, as a people, we, I think we've lost the ability to disagree with people without vilifying people. Right? Let me say this. Some of you, even in this room, disagree about abortion. I value you anyway. Even if we don't believe that, even if I think you're wrong and you think I'm wrong, we may disagree about homosexuality. We may disagree about politics. We may disagree about immigration. We may disagree about Jesus, but I still value you. Man, when we blow up at people online, what sort of light is that? We have to value people even when they don't believe like we do. I'm so, listen, I am so glad heaven didn't throw me away when I didn't want anything to do with Jesus. I said some dumb stuff. I did some dumb things. I don't know about you, but I was not a saint. I am so glad Jesus didn't throw me away when I, you know, I, oh, you know, you post something about Christmas. Oh, Christmas is a fairy tale. Well, your mom, <laughs> caps, exclamation points show you value value do the people who don't believe like you do they actually feel valuable to you i think that's a really good question the people in your life who they know what you believe and you know what they believe do they actually feel valued by you or do they feel cut off right because because man we're just never going to agree on this can we actually i i understood this is that i do have an enemy and it's not you I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I have to remind myself of that. I do have an enemy, and his name's the devil, okay? But you're not my enemy. People are not my enemy. Jesus came to save the least of these, all right? Every single one of us has been the least of these at some point, all right? He left the 99 to come looking for us. Could we adopt that same thing? And I'm going to value people even if they, they believe differently than me. Value people, the, th the third uh, thought, value people no matter what they look like. Value people no matter what they look like. Depending, I think we get a little bit better at this as we age, um, but especially if you're younger in the room. Guys, uh, years ago, um, one of my favorite memories of Jeremiah, I was reminding him of this this morning, is when he was in kindergarten, and we were planning to go on an outreach to downtown to Safe House Outreach um, to, to minister to some homeless guys. And so we had kind of been talking up uh, that, that outreach to him for a number of weeks because he's five, right? I want to get him excited about it. We're telling him, like, hey, buddy, uh, we're going to go down to this area. You've grown up in the suburbs. You haven't seen things like this. And so you're going to go down. These guys are going to probably look different than, differently than you. They're going to dress differently than you. Some of them might smell. Some of them might be drunk. Some of them might just say weird things. Some of them love Jesus. Many of them don't. But what we're doing, we're going down there to show them that, hey, Jesus remembers you. And Jesus loves you. And we think that you're important, too. You're as important as we are. And so we're just going to go down there and do that. He was all excited. We picked him up uh, that morning and, or that afternoon after school. And we asked him, like, hey, buddy, how was your day? And he was just quiet. And we said, hey, did something happen? He nodded his head. And we said, well, what happened? He said, well, I told my friends that we were going to go down and spend time with homeless people. And they laughed at me. And we're like, <laughs> Like, at some point, you're going to be made fun of for being a Christian. But, like, at five, that's a, starting a little young, you know. And so we're like, e, is he still going to want to go? And so we asked him. We said, well, buddy, how did that make you feel when they laughed at you? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, it made me feel sad for the homeless man. I'm sitting in the front seat like, who says that? Who thinks? thinks that. I know I don't think like that. I have to fight to get to that place. But he instinctively was not thinking about him. He was actually, for a second, had supernaturally, at five years old, he had tapped into God's heart for people, someone else outside of himself. And I think that's what makes Jesus so fantastic. One of the things is that he could have been hiding in an ivory tower, but he's like, He's with the blind guys outside the city gates. He's stooping down to, to pick up crippled people. 
Like the people that society says are not important, Jesus is actually saying is important. James 2, 4, 2 1. I love this as a good reminder. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over other people? For example, suppose someone comes into your meeting on a Sunday morning, right, dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or you can just sit on the floor, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? I love this. I love, there are professional uh, athletes who come to this church and just kind of fly underneath the radar. I love that. I'm proud of you guys. There are people in here who make, literally make, make over a million dollars a year. Don't need the attention. And we wouldn't give you the attention anyways. But <laughs> There's something really special in life when we can come to this place and I'm going to give you value if you don't believe like me if you don't look like me, there, listen, again, especially if you're a teenager, I know what it's like. We've all been there. If you're older, like, you, listen, there's nothing special about what you're going through. We've been there before, okay? I know what it's like to be in middle school and high school. I know it's like that kid over there and that kid over there. But I'm telling you, there's something that if a follower of Christ, if you can tap into this thing to get your eyes off yourself and to start getting God's heart for other people, and you actually value people if they have Down syndrome, and you value people if they didn't take a shower this week, because guess what? Maybe they don't even have a shower. Maybe they're living in a hotel room. To value people if they bring in their, their lunch in a, in a Publix bag because they can't afford a lunchbox. To value people even if they don't have those shoes. Jeremiah told me that, you know, at the middle school down the street, one of their favorite things to do is make fun of kids who don't have nice shoes. That's just the lamest thing. What would, it, what would it look like if we actually valued people no matter what they look like? Could we reclaim that as the people of God? That we don't judge people by the outside to value other cultures, right? To value other ethnicities, for the rich to value the poor, and the poor to value the rich, and the urban to value the suburban, and vice versa. What would it look like if we actually valued people who just live completely differently than us? They just look different. But there's still people, too, who need the love of Jesus. We value people. Here, uh, here's another one. Value people no matter where they're from. Value people no matter where they're from. Um, let me talk to us in the suburbs for a second. Uh, that whole migrant caravan thing, how'd you do with that? I know you're, some of you are like, oh, God, he's getting into politics. Some of you are like, I don't even know what that was because you don't watch the news. Let's change on both sides, okay? <laughs> um, uh, just, just recently, over the last few months, um, there's a group of people. Started, some started in Honduras, El Salvador, um, and some of them traveled up to 2,500 miles to get to the border uh, to try and seek asylum, saying, hey, it's not safe where, where I'm at. I'm trying to get into America. And I, you know, uh, before we get too political, because as a pastor, let me just offend everybody. Uh, some of us are more Republican than we are Christian, and that needs to change. Um, I, yes, we need border safety. Yes, we need to do our best to keep the bad guys out. I understand all that. Here's the deal, though. I'm not a politician. I'm a Christian. Uh, I'm a pastor. And the Bible that I read is filled with Jesus saying something like this, Matthew 25, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And here's the deal. I, I don't know immigration policy. I'm not here. I'm not trying to change the country. I, I don't. I don't know all that. I'm not, I don't know the domino effects of economic policy. I don't know any of that stuff. But here's what I do know is that we need to take care of people. And if they're here, I want to take care of people. Like some people, you know, we, we especially, it's really, it's re listen, it's really easy in Buford to say a lot of things about people that you don't know, right? Because you have food to eat this afternoon and you have a place to go home to, Right? But, you know, when we, it's really easy to say things like, well, they knew the border was closed. They shouldn't have come anyways. But I, something inside me says, how bad does it have to be at home that you would be willing to take your kids 2,500 miles, walking half of it, some of it on a train, some of it on the back of a truck, to get to a border that you already know is closed? Like, how is that better than where you're at? And, and I'm, I'm listening to some of these guys. They say one of the guys had uh, some disabilities in his, leg, in his legs. He says, there's no work. If you're over 30, there's no work. There's no food. There's no work. Uh, it's dangerous. 
Um, like, there's nothing. And so we'll risk this. And it's really easy here to say, oh, oh, oh. It's the same sort of thing, right? When we hear that somebody dies in a bomb in Afghanistan, man, eh, next article. Oh, two people got shot in Texas. The, it, the world is ending, right? Because, because outside of our bubble, we don't really care about it. I'm just saying, guys, as followers of Christ, we don't have that option. We don't have that option. It, when was the last time we allowed ourselves to feel what other people are going through? For 60 seconds, we got our eyes off of ourselves and our own beliefs and all that sort of stuff, and we just got God's heart for people. I don't, listen, I don't, if the shoe was on the other foot, I'd probably be at the border too. I'd probably be knocking, being like, hey, is there anything? Is there any food for my kids? Is there any possibility that they could have a life better than mine? I don't know about you. This is really easy to sit in Buford and say a lot of nasty things about people we've never met because they're not from here. And what we, what we need to rediscover is this thing called compassion. Okay, compassion. Have we even forgotten the definition of it? A willingness to allow yourself to feel the suffering of others. Like when was the last time we actually allowed ourselves to feel the pain of an immigrant coming into America, right, and trying to fit in? And let me just say that. Maybe even you're here today and you immigrated to America uh, and, and you're here with us. I'm glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. I value you. I'm glad you're here. I want to help you. If we can help you to fit in, if we can help you, you know, we connect you to an ESL, English as a second language, anything. Like, I want to help you. Like, again, I'm not a politician. I'm a pastor, okay? And so I know what my job is, and I know what my job is not. And if you're here, I love you, and I'm so glad you're here. Talking about what, what we're giving to today, when was the last time we ever actually allowed ourselves to even think about the fact that there are like five-year-olds and six-year-olds who are being molested every single day? 13-year-olds who are getting sold every single night. Like, when was the last time we actually allowed ourselves to think about that? Because that requires that the bubble gets popped a little bit. Be, and we don't want to go there because that requires something of us, right? That's why, like, when you see a homeless guy downtown asking for money, you don't look him in the eyes because that might require something of you. But we got to learn to actually care about people who don't look like us, who aren't from here, right? I know we're really good many times at caring for our own, but what happens if we actually, for 60 seconds, got our eyes off of ourselves and actually started caring for people out there? I think that's the beauty of going on a missions trip. And I'm going to say this really loud. Every single person in this church should go on a missions trip. The younger you can go, the better. And don't go to, like, Europe. That's awesome. Okay, go to a third world country too. All right? You need to find out that there are people in this world who don't live like you. All right? Like, like I've been to Ethiopia. I've measured the kids' arms right? And I've seen kid after kid show up in the red. That means they have less than a month if something doesn't change. Like kid after kid after kid after kid. And you say, oh, they shouldn't have had all those babies. Oh my God, I've heard that. Okay, that's a different conversation. The kids are here, okay? Do you, how do you know her story? Because I've stood in the six by six, 36 square foot shack in India of the widowed mother of five. You're going to judge her for having all those kids? Her husband died of cancer because he actually was scavenging on the trash heaps trying to find recyclables. And he got cancer because it gets hot and all the fumes come up. Her son's now doing the same job. I've been in Nicaragua. I've, like, I've been there where the, the average girl gets pregnant at 12 or 13 years old. Like, I've been to these places. And so it changes your perspective. If you've never been there, you never came from those countries, it's hard to have these perspectives. I'm just telling you, God wants to give us the gift, once again, of valuing people who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, and who aren't from this suburban bubble. Okay? Last thing is this. All right, I know it's heavy in here. That's a good thing sometimes. Value people no matter if they can pay you back. <laughs> Value people, bless people, give to people. Uh, uh, Mike Turner, um, who's one of our friends of the house here, uh, he's a missionary we support down in Nicaragua. Many of you actually support children in the school down there at LifeLink International. Uh, Mike Turner has a saying that um, the, one of the best things you can be involved in is giving to people who can never give you anything back, who can never give you anything in return. And uh, I agree with that. I'm really bad at that. Uh, my wife, Summer, is really good at that. You know, a minute ago, I talked about Jeremiah. Like, you know, I just, I felt sad for the homeless man. That's like a hallmark moment. Like, nobody says that. She gets that from, I mean, he gets that from her. Um, I have to fight my own selfishness. I've, I see that in my other son. <laughs> he and I are more alike, and Summer and Jeremiah are more alike. Um, 
she, she's done this thing she did in our, in our old neighborhood, but in, in our newer neighborhood, um, you, she'll notice, you know, you see like the same person walking down the street like every single day. And uh, it turns out that, you know, time two, times three, uh, saw this teenage boy and uh, pulled over, saw him walking out of the neighborhood for like the umpteenth time, pulled over, said, hey, what's going on? He's like, stranger danger. She's like, no, you can get in the car. Where, where are you trying to go? And so he got in and took him just right down the street to Kroger um, and just found out that this kid was trying to do some college prep sort of stuff and rain, snow, sleet, dark, light, cold, hot. He's out there walking literally on the side of the road. There's no sidewalk. Uh, we almost hit him one night because he's walking like an inch away with an umbrella in like pitch black outside. And um, he's doing this every single night to try and go and get ready for college. He doesn't have transportation to be able to get there. And so she starts giving him a ride every time she sees him. And, uh, and then just a few weeks ago, the, the boys in the car took him to go get ice cream. And uh, why? Because that's just what you do for people. And he's like, no, 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 I'm okay. And she's like, no, no, you don't have to pay for it. I'll pay for it. And he's like, oh, really? Okay, I'll take whipped cream. And he put some sprinkles on it and a little cherry on it. Because he thought he'd have to pay for it. He didn't have any money. I'm telling you guys, one of the best things you can do in life is give to people who can never give you anything back. Never give you anything back. That's one of the mo- it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so what we're going to do in just a few minutes, okay, we're going to give in our Christmas gift to the world offering. Let me make you a promise. You're not getting that money back. Okay, it's not a loan. <laughs> You're not going to see, you know, a, a kid one day and he's going to write you a check, all right? Um, but this will be one of the most blessed things you've ever done in your entire life, being able to give to people who can never give you anything back. Um, uh, one of my, before we give, one of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Tozer, A.W. Tozer. Um, I love this guy. He said this about giving. This is great. He says, as base a thing as money often is, Yet it can be transmuted into everlasting treasure. It can be converted into food for the hungry and clothing for the poor. It can keep a missionary actively winning lost men to the light of the gospel and thus transmute itself into heavenly values. Any temporal possession can be turned into everlasting wealth. I love this last part. Whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. That is so good. Whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality because I've taken it out of my hands and I put it into the hands of heaven. And so, guys, I, 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 depending on how long you've been here, you've seen more of this than others. I've, I've had the privilege to be uh, on the ground in Ethiopia. Uh, I've actually been in the orphanage uh, t- twice that uh, Victory built years ago through a Christmas gift to the world giving uh, that, that went to an orphanage for girls, started with girls who are under 12, who both of their parents died of AIDS. And again, if you're not from that world, you don't know that that's a reality. Like literally, they would just, the way they filled the orphanage was they would drive down the street at night and they would find five and six-year-old girls just wandering around on the street trying to eat trash. I mean, trying to eat stuff out of, out of just the gutters. Um, be, in, like an inch away from being sex trafficked, they would just find these girls and they said, hey, do you want a place to live? You understand how bad that conversation could go. And they got them off the street and they got them into this home and now they've learned Christ. Now they're graduating. Some of them are getting married. Right? We've actually, ate, we're aging girls out and we're setting them out into life. I've been in the brothel that we bought in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and turned it into a church. And I've been through two graduation ceremonies of 70 and 85 girls who used to be prostitutes. Now they actually have hope. They came in, they found Christ, job training, they left. I've met the ones who are married and now have kids with their husbands, like just completely turning them around. The hospital we built in India, um, the, the school we built in, in Nicaragua. I'm just telling you, some of you will never have the opportunity to go here, but some of you can. We do have mission trips. Go on the mission trips. But, but I'm telling you, what you're giving today, here's my promise to you. There will be people in heaven saying thank you. But one of the most blessed things to do is to give to somebody who can never give anything back to you. The, the money we gave last year to Out of Darkness, it was a, a local um, organization here pulling girls out of prostitution. Um, the, all the, all the, you can imagine all the, the legal hump, uh, hurdles and humps that you have to jump through to, to be able to like, get to building a home for these girls. Uh, it actually just got approved uh, this week. And so within the next 30 days, there'll actually be girls pulled off the street and brought into here uh, and get their lives completely turned around. That's amazing because we gave, okay? And so last year, we almost gave across our, our campuses, we almost gave $500,000. Uh, this year, uh, our goal is to, to up that. And I think we can do that when we give together. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. 
we're going to give in just a second. Um, but before we do that, uh, I want to remind us half is going globally to uh, Thailand. Um, they're actually, what it's doing, it's, it's building an equipping center for, for the guys who are going to come in and help out. Because literally what that organization does, it focuses on boys. Boys who are being sex trafficked. About 60 come across the border of Thailand and Myanmar uh, every single day. Um, and so they're focusing on boys, trying to, trying to keep boys or out of sex trafficking, trying to pull them, them out if they're already in there. Uh, so it's helping them on the ground. And then the other half is going here locally uh, to uh, Street Grace. And so what we did uh, while we prepared to give, I know many of us give online. Um, some of you actually brought checks uh, today. But while you're preparing that giving, we actually have a four-minute video. Okay, and then on the other side of that, we're going to give and we'll, um, we'll depart for the day. But uh, we have a four-minute video because the, the president, the director of Out of Darkness was actually with us at Victory this weekend, and so we grabbed this video clip so you can hear a little bit of his heart for what we're giving to today. Okay, let's go ahead and show that video. Oh, oh, Bob Rogers, who is the director of Street Grace, is here. So, Bob, I want you to come. I want you to welcome Bob as he comes up on the stage, and I want to just ask him a couple questions before we take up this offering. Uh, I asked Bob uh, to come this weekend because he's been coming to our church, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. And so um, we were talking a little bit, uh, my wife and I were talking about Street Grace because she's been on this board for a while and then you've recently joined the board the last few years. And since that time, Street Grace has just really gone forward because of your leadership. And so we're just so thankful for what you are doing with Street Grace and the team that you put together. But uh, you were, you were uh, uh, a president of, of a college and, uh, and, and yet here you are now, you're running a nonprofit. I, I wanna ask you just, just real briefly, why? Why are you doing this? Yeah, um, but I have a long answer, but I will give the short one. Okay. Um, about three and a half years ago, I was walking down the campus and saw that we had a guest speaker in that was talking about human trafficking. He told a story about a sex trafficking sting operation that had just taken place. A guy had been arrested, he was handcuffed, and was waiting on the police to come and transport him off the premises. And the guy was standing there talking to him, and he said, man, all these officers know you, and they called you by name, and they said you've been arrested three other times for drug trafficking. Why on earth would you do sex trafficking? And the guy wasn't angry, he wasn't mad, he wasn't bitter, he just looked up and said, I can sell a bag of drugs once. I can sell a 13-year-old girl six or eight times a night. And I just remember that's what happened to me. And at 10.30 that night, I'm back in the hotel room in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and I'm laying there at a, you know, almost a 50-year-old guy with tears in my eyes. And I called my wife and I said, I don't know what's going on, but I think my midlife crisis hit today <laughs> and I need a motorcycle. Um, and she said, no, you just need to come home. Um, and a year and a half later, we were standing in the driveway and had talked about it over and over and over. And I said, I just don't know what to do. And she said, Bob, I think you were made for this. And I said, you realize it doesn't come with a contract in a company car. And she said, Bob, I think you were made for this. Um, and that was it. So you basically traded a secure job as a president of a college for something that you didn't even know how it was all gonna turn out. I didn't. Um, but I will tell you the significance factor that you yes. talked about has gone through the roof. It doesn't pay the bills, but interestingly enough, they've all been taken care of. Isn't that amazing? Um, it really is. That's amazing. It really is. So tell us, just tell us, give us a little idea of street grace and what, what y'all do. Yeah, we're an anti-domestic minor sex trafficking organization, which means we focus, we see the issue of sex trafficking through three different lenses. One of them is Christ-centered. We believe that Christ is attempting to redeem all things back to him at all times. The second thing is that we're child-focused, so almost everything we do, it applies to adults, men, women, boys, and girls, but we focus on 18 and under. Yes. Um, and then everything we do focuses on the demand. And there's a lot of work on the restorative care, and we need that. It's critical. We have to have that when someone's been harmed by this. But if we want to end it, you have to go after the demand. And, and Atlanta is a really big city for this too, right? One of the largest in the country. Estimates are that the underground sex economy in Metro Atlanta alone is about a $290 million a year business. That's going on right now as we speak. Yes. Hotels. Craigslist, all these kinds of different things that are happening around us. And this is what Street Grace does, where our goal is to end it, is Correct. to get it, get it 
completely eradicated in our city, as much as depends on us in this city. That's right. We want to get rid of it. And this offering that we're going to take up, half of this offering is going to help this ministry get rid of sex trafficking in your city. How many of you agree with that? That's something to give for. Thank you, Bob. Thank Thank you very much.